I was inspired by Steve's uh, presentation there at the end. And uh, first of all, uh, something that most people aren't aware of is at the end of World War I, the, uh, you had the Paris Peace Accords that finished the uh, settlement of who got what land and how they divided the countries up uh, in 1920. And they weren't able to deal with Israel. And so they had a uh, appendage conference a few months later in San Remo, Italy, in 1920. And uh, what I'm about to tell you was voted on by uh, 45, it was approved by all, the League of Nations. And that was that they were to divide, to divide uh, the Middle East up in which Mesopotamia, which is today Iraq, and uh, Syria and other countries like that were given mandates to the French and the British to oversee them till they became a nation. And so Iraq was under British control. Jordan was under British control. It was called Transjordan. And then they were supposed to be like a father overseeing uh, a son growing to maturity. And that's why if you look at the independence of all of those countries, Syria and Lebanon were under French control in the mandate, and Israel also was placed under British control. And this is why in the 1930s all of those countries became independent countries except Israel. But Israel had the same mandate as the rest of these countries, and this has been lost in history. Uh, a guy recently wrote a Ph.D. dissertation in international law at the University of Geneva, uh, a Canadian. Uh, his name is Jacques Gutierre, and uh, I think he did it in French, but you can get a copy for $350 is all. Uh, of his dissertation that demonstrates that Israel has the legal right to the land. And he proved it based on international law going back to 1920, the League of Nations, and how all of this stuff was transferred over in 1945 when the League of Nations was disbanded and the United Nations began to and became continued to be international law under the United Nations jurisdiction. And actually, the vote in 19, November 1947 in San Francisco for the United Nations to recognize Israel was illegal because Israel was already declared to be a nation uh, at the San Remo Conference, in which all the nations of the world, I think 48 different nations, approved this agreement just as much as uh, Iraq, Jordan, and these other countries. The problem happened is Britain... England did not transition, fulfill their part in the mandate, and help Israel to become a nation. And as I say, this is something people are amazed to hear about, but it's true history. And go on the uh, YouTube and stuff and look up San Remo Conference and all this kind of stuff on the Internet. And uh, the, then you have the authoritative work uh, completed about four or five years ago by Jacques Gutierre, a Canadian, uh, who demonstrated this peer-reviewed uh, by law professors, international law professors at the University of Geneva. It took them 20 years to write this thing. And I've got a copy of it, but this is not my talk today. But I just thought I would throw that in. So Israel has gotten a shaft every time uh, when it comes to these kinds of things. If, if Israel had been a, become a nation in the 30s when it should have been, you can imagine how many people would not have lost their life in World War II. But here, here's another interesting thing. Uh, this speaks for itself. It just shows you how God has used different Gentiles, even perhaps unbelieving Gentiles, uh, to help the nation of Israel. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, in turning down Golda Meir's request for arms to defend her country, is reported to have said, let the Israelis bleed a little. Yom Kippur. Golda Meir is desperate. Without help, Israel will not survive many more days of the pounding assault from all sides, despite all the Kahalanis and those like him who are bravely defending their homeland and sacrificing their lives on all the front lines. And so she picks up the phone and calls the private line of U.S. President Richard Nixon. It is 3 o'clock in the morning. 
Television film producer and documentarian Bill McKay's investigation of the American role in the Yom Kippur War describes what happened when President Nixon took Golda Meir's call in the middle of the night. Mr. President, if you don't help us, the Jewish people will never survive. He said something interesting, if not strange. He said, you know, I could almost hear my mother's voice. She would tell me stories and read to me from the Old Testament, the heroes of the Bible. And one afternoon she said, Richard, someday you're going to be in a position where you can help save the Jewish people. And when that day comes, you must do everything in your power. And he said at that moment I realized, maybe for the first time in my presidency, why I had become president of the United States. It was the largest airlift of armaments since World War II. The president kept his word. Everything Golda asked for, she got. Every weapon, every vehicle, every piece of equipment, and all the ammunition to operate them. A virtual arsenal airlifted overnight to Israel's front lines. And many military experts credit that decision, that request, at that moment, as the essential element that saved Israel from destruction. In another striking parallel to David in the Bible, Richard Nixon turned aside the Goliath of indifference to Israel in his government, faced down a powerful Secretary of State who would turn against him, and accepted the threat to his own presidency to save Israel in its hour of need. Before it was over, the Yom Kippur War demonstrated one of the most incredible turnaround victories ever recorded in military history. Well, I just wanted to show that because there's many examples of Gentiles, even though they may not have the best reputation, uh, being influenced by their childhood upbringing. Uh, you have the same thing with Harry Truman. You have it with uh, uh, Lloyd George, who was a British prime minister during World War I. Uh, you have it with Lord Balfour, who uh, grew up hearing about the Old Testament in Israel, and that's why they had it. Basically, what you have is people like Lord Balfour and Lloyd George and Harry Truman believed that the Jewish people had been abused by uh, the nations, especially Christendom. And therefore, the Christendom owed them their own country so they would have a place to go and not be persecuted. And that was the logic of Lloyd George and uh, Balfour and even Harry Truman. In fact, Harry Truman was the most pro-Israel senator before he became president. In fact, as a senator, he tried to pass a resolution to force FDR to rec receive that ship in 1945. I forget the name of it. Does anybody know the name of the ship with Jews that was turned away from all those different countries and eventually had to go back and they were killed in the Holocaust? What? Could be, St. Louis, I, yes, and that's right, and Truman tried to get Congress to pass something. Truman also said, he said, I didn't need anybody to lobby me, because he had these, these were his convictions. Uh, I don't think Truman knew anything about Bible prophecy. Uh, I have a Ph.D. dissertation from the Hoover Institute in Stanford which argues that there's no way that FDR would have ever recognized Israel. He, in fact, there's a new book out on Harry Truman. It's got a first chapter on it. It's about how FDR snowed the Jews, how he kept this certain public persona being pro-Israel, but secretly he never did anything to help them. And he wouldn't have recognized Israel. His entire administration was anti-Israel. And God decided to step in, didn't he? And so he put the cussing Baptist from Missouri into the presidency uh, three, one month after FDR was elected to his fourth term. And I've read that Tr uh, Truman had only met FDR twice <laughs> before he became president, and he was the vice president. So that shows you uh, the way politics were back then, and God put him in. 
I'm sure perhaps to make a decision to drop the atomic bomb as well as to recognize the state of Israel. So God has used Christians and Gentiles uh, to help the modern world restore the nation of Israel in a sovereign way. But now we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God. And uh, the reason I want to talk about this, I'm not going to talk about the millennium and how wonderful it's going to be and all of that. I want to talk about what is the kingdom of God and uh, is the kingdom of God present today? And so I want to define the biblical use of the term kingdom of God. So first of all, you have four different facets of God's kingdom program if you want to look at that. And first of all is the eternal or universal kingdom. And this is just God's sovereign rule from the beginning of history to the end of history. The fact that he is sovereignly ruling. And so this facet refers to God's rule and providence and in sovereignty in that God is always in control. Probably the video you just saw is an evidence of that providence. You know, Hillary Clinton during the election last time talked about who's ready to take that call at 3 a.m. in the morning. Well, here was, a, here was an actual call at 3 a.m. in the morning. Golda Meir had thoughts of suicide. She almost committed suicide according to her own uh, records. And yet she called Nixon and he helped support the nation of Israel in due time even though his administration was against it. And I'm sure God's hand was involved in that. So the term eternal emphasizes the timeless aspect, the fact that God is never out of control. I mean, how can the God that's described in the Bible not be in control? The type of God, no, not some God that some, somebody else has defined as a force. I feel a tremor in the force. Well, uh, yes. But God is not just a force. He's a person. And he is in total control. And then the term universal emphasizes the sphere and scope that no matter where things exist in the universe, everything is within the sovereign will and control of God. And that's important. If God's not in control of the big things, how can he be in control of the little things like your life? And so he is. Then you have what is called the theocratic kingdom. Theo means God and cratic means rule. And so it refers to God's rule by means of and through a theocracy over one nation, and that one nation is Israel. It's not the United States. I've heard of the Mayflower Compact. You don't go and volunteer to make a compact with God. He picks you. You don't, hey, God, we're going to make a contract with you. You can make all the contracts you want with God, but Israel is the only nation that God sought out Abram and decided to make a contract with. He chose them. And so it was established under Moses. In other words, that's when they became a nation at Mount Sinai with the Mosaic Law serving as the constitution of the kingdom. It underwent two aspects in its history. Number one is first the mediatorial kingdom, and that is where God ruled through mediators like Moses, Joshua, and all the judges up until Samuel. And then secondly, it's, you have the monarchical kingdom when God ruled through the house of David, through the different kings up until 586 B.C. when Zedekiah was removed from the throne and the times of the Gentiles began. That's what the times of the Gentiles means, is God is no longer going to be ruling through the nation of Israel, you see. And so that is suspended during, from 586 onward, and that's why you have the prophecies in Daniel 2 and 7 of the Gentile nations that are going to be in control of the world. And uh, they then, are, when Christ returns, he's going to set up his kingdom that's not going to end. And then thirdly, you have the messianic or the millennial kingdom. And so the definition is the, the Messiah's rule over Israel and over the world from Jerusalem and from the throne of David. This is what the Old Testament says. He's not talking about ruling through, from Rome or even ruling from heaven, as a lot of people today are saying. Instead, he's going to actually be there in Jerusalem. You can go visit him, shake his hand, don't even have to make a campaign contribution to be able to do that. So the term messianic kingdom emphasizes that in this kingdom, the Messiah himself will rule directly. 
not going to have a bureaucracy. It's going to be a dictatorship. You're not going to get to vote for Jesus or vote against Jesus. It's going to be a very um, uh, narrow down, small government for Steve back there versus big government. And David is going to be the ruler or the prince who is going to rule over Israel under the overall rule of the Messiah, Jesus, during that time. Then you have the term millennial kingdom that emphasizes how long the kingdom will last. Over, it'll be exactly 1,000 years, according to the book of Revelation. And you had, even before that prophecy was given in the book of Revelation, you had many Jewish uh, commentators before the time of Christ speculate that the kingdom would be a thousand years. Now you had some that speculated it would be like 7,000 years and others, but this was the most common speculation based on the septimillennial view, you know, one day equals a thousand years and all of that kind of stuff. And so many speculated before God revealed it in the book of John that it would be a thousand years in length. And so the Old Testament talks about the millennium. So this kingdom was a major area of Old Testament prophecy. And this kingdom was offered by Jesus, and this kingdom was rejected in Matthew chapter 12. That's the pivot point, and therefore was withdrawn from that generation. In Matthew 12, you have the uh, unpardonable sin being committed by the Jewish people. And that is their leaders, who the Jewish people followed, rejected Jesus as a Messiah. And that's why you can't blaspheme the Holy Spirit today. I know people get on YouTube, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit and all this kind of stuff, something that only young people would do. Uh, and, and, you know, it's popular to do these kinds of things. But only that generation of Jewish people who saw the Messiah in person, who saw his miracles, heard him, etc., could uh, commit the unpardonable sin of rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit of the Messiah in person with signs and wonders and miracles. And that's a historic event. And every person today has the possibility of becoming a believer up until the time they die. Even if they got on YouTube and said, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit, they can, you know, theoretically become believers. It's all within the will of God, but I'm just saying, this is when Israel officially rejects Jesus, and this is when... Jesus starts speaking to them in parables as the book of Isaiah talks about. So then you have the inner advent age, which is not part of the kingdom. Some people try to say there's a mystery form of the kingdom today. Well, I don't agree with that. I'll be talking about that in a moment. But the definition of the inner advent age uh, is described by the term Christendom that I've already explained to you in previous talks and means people anywhere in the world that claim loyalty to Jesus, both false and true loyalty. And the time of this, it began with Israel's rejection of the Messiahship of Jesus, roughly around Matthew 12, and will end with Israel's acceptance of the Messiahship of Jesus by the end of the tribulation period. Thus, it will include the current church age, but also the tribulation ending at the second coming. So the inner advent age is not just the church age. The church age is included. But when you look at the parables in Matthew 13, we're not going to look at them. But when you look at them, they describe uh, events that that go beyond the church that include the tribulation. That's why the Matthew 13 passage talks about uh, the judgment that comes at the end of the inner advent age, which is the second coming. So the inner advent age is the church age plus... The tribulation. And so that's the period that Matthew 13 is talking about. And some people try to say there there is a mystery form of the kingdom because they misinterpret Matthew 13 that talks about the mysteries of the kingdom. It doesn't have the word form in there. And so many in our camp have said there is a spiritual form of the kingdom, the messianic kingdom today. And this is the idea that many today have that somehow we're in the kingdom and you're hearing more and more about this, the social action people, the social do-gooders, and more and more people basically are rejecting premillennialism for a form, well, here's premillennialism where you have the church age, in other words, the Jews reject Jesus, you have the tribulation period, and then Christ returns before 
the thousand-year reign of Christ. That's pre-millennialism. And then you have the first resurrection and the second resurrection, and only premillennialism takes both resurrections to mean resurrection. Every time the Greek word anastasis is used in the Greek New Testament, it always refers to the raising of a body. It never refers to a non-physical or spiritual resurrection because the word means to raise the body. It cannot, it is never used of something spiritual or authorial or non-physical. Because uh, just like our English word resurrection means, you know, but we do have abstract uses of it, the resurrection of a football team or a hockey team or something like that who was playing bad and now they're playing good. And they used to be good, you know, that kind of stuff. But the Bible always uses it for the raising of the body. Now, amillennialism is the view that the church age and the millennium are the same. We're living in the millennium. And I always say, if this is the millennium, I must be in the ghetto side. But then I realized there is no ghetto in the millennium. What's even worse is there's some preterists out there, full preterists who believe what's called transmillennialism. They believe we're in the new heavens and the new earth. You thought it was hard to believe we're in the millennium, but they're beyond the millennium. See, transmillennialism. And uh, you thought that, you know, there's certainly no ghetto there. Well, the lake of fire is not a good place to be, but nevertheless... This is a view that basically was developed by the Roman Catholics. It came out of North Africa. Almost all of Christendom earlier held to premillennialism. It was such a strong tradition in the early church. And guess what came, else came out of North Africa? See, you had back in the day the uh, place of Greek philosophy shifted from Athens to Alexandria, Egypt by the time of Christ. And so this was the center of Greek philosophy. And this is where all this mysticism came from that uh, people are talking about, Warren Smith and others, uh, came from North Africa, came from the place where Greek philosophy dominated in the early church. They're called the Desert Fathers. This is the same place that rejected the literal interpretation of a thousand years in Revelation 20. It didn't fit into their a priori worldview, you see. But you go to the places where the apostles wrote books of the Bible from, like Turkey and places, they were all premillennial. And so uh, this is the idea. In the 300s, after Constantine Christianized uh, the Roman Empire, you talk about a time of church growth. It's estimated before Constantine about 8% of the Roman Empire was Christian, but by, in just 30 years, it was up to like 98%. That's some church growth. But that was the time in which all these bad heresies came into the church because you, God didn't save all those people, did he? And so you have the bringing of the world into the church, and that's when you have the development and the resonation of amillennialism within the Catholic Church. And by the 500s, they have anathematized premillennialism, the view that Christ is literally going to reign on the church because that view that started there in North Africa and Alexandria had spread through the church. And so the, you, can, you can see the optimism that they would have. If you grew from 8% to 98% in 30 years, then you must think you're in the kingdom, right? Many of the people uh, that worked... Uh, in the uh, Constantinian Empire had the wounds from the persecution that they received from the Roman Empire before Constantine Christianized that. And so I'm sure they thought, man, we're really gaining and this is the millennium that we're in. Well, sorry, uh, it's not. And that's amillennialism that developed. Can everybody say, ah, you bad people. Then we have postmillennialism that developed a little later, and it especially took off in the 1700s, although there are people clearly in the 1600s that held this view. And uh, with, with the rise of the Enlightenment, people believe, once again, because of the progress that Protestantism was making in Europe and cr so-called Christianizing the world, then they believe that Christ would come back only after the church has Christianized the entire world. In other words, 
the majority of people are converted to Jesus Christ, they believe, and the world then is Christianized, becomes Christian. Uh, of course, you wonder if some of these people actually participate in a local church. We can't even get local churches to have that kind of atmosphere, let alone uh, the world and all of this kind of stuff. And it basically has the same view of amillennialism of a present spiritual kingdom. And so that uh, view uh, you know, is being promoted by the uh, Reconstructionist movement, the Dominion Theology people, the New Apostolic movement, uh, the Latter Rain movement. I believe some big events happened around here related to that. Uh, and so this whole idea of optimistic about the church conquering, you know, is, is related to postmillennialism or has those ideas. And so this is the trend now among uh, evangelicals is to move to an amillennial, or in other words, a spiritual form of the kingdom today. And historically, they've been called amillennial or postmillennial. But, you know, these postmodern people don't want to be nailed down. Uh, you know, and identified as holding to something specific, so they won't take any of these labels. And so this is the basis. If this is the kingdom, we're kingdom building. We've got to do social action. You know, the kingdom is a time when, uh, you know, there's economic uh, so-called equality and all of these other kinds of things. And so this is why uh, liberals as well as conservatives in some sense are, are emphasizing that. But premillennialism, by the way, let me back up a moment. Amills and postmills would say that Christ is reigning now on at the right hand of the Father over the earth because he was victorious at the cross. We agree that he was victorious at the cross, and he earned the right to rule as a second Adam uh, at his death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. That shows his victory, but he is not exerting his rule right now. In fact, to, today, if to use a biblical analogy or picture, today is a time like you had with David, who was anointed king, but Saul was still the king. And, and for seven years, even though Saul, uh, David, was anointed king, he didn't rule as king. And what did he do? He had to flee, and he was kind of a... a an outlaw type guy in a sense that he was running from King Saul who was trying to kill him who represented this you know evil age and he gathered up those it says who owed taxes and uh, other people who were considered losers or rejects from Saul's kingdom and then seven years later when he actually became king then those that followed him became the, what's called the Hebrew calls the gibberim, the mighty men in the kingdom of God. And that's what he's doing today. He's gathering out from among the Gentiles, as Acts 15 says, a people for his name. And what are we promised one day? As his bride to be at his, sit at his right hand, Revelation 3.21, and rule with him just as he conquered and is sitting at the Father's right hand right now. Now what's he doing at the right hand? Is this the Davidic kingdom? No. Because that's going to be in Jerusalem. All the passages in the Old Testament teach that, that talk about this issue. He's sitting at the right hand in his session, interceding for the saints, right? I mean, the Bible's clear on that. He's not reigning and ruling in the millennial or Davidic sense now. You always have the kingdom of God where God is sovereign over the universe, as we all recognize, but that's not the Davidic kingdom. That's not the kingdom that was started with Moses, where Israel is supposed to be the head over all the other nations. You cannot have the kingdom of God without Israel converted to Jesus as the Messiah and him reigning and ruling from Jerusalem. So all of these spiritual ideas that are becoming popular today uh, are simply throwbacks to post-millennial or amillennial ideas. So, see, they believe in continual progress, onward and upward, every day and every way. Oswald Alice, who was an amill postman, it's hard to figure him out, says literal interpretation has always been a marked feature of premillennialism. In dispensationalism, which has been carried to an extreme, uh, we have seen that this literalism found its most thoroughgoing expression in the claim that Israel must mean Israel. Can you imagine that? Israel means Israel. Wow, what a radical position. 
and that the church was a mystery. Well, I think Paul said that at least three times. Oh, well. Unknown to the prophets and first made known to the apostle Paul. Well, I mean, anybody with two eyes that are coordinated can read the New Testament and see what that's what it says. Now, if the principle of interpretation is adopted that Israel always means Israel, then it does not mean the church. See, he's saying he holds the replacement theology, but he's saying if you take it literally, you know, those bozos known as premillennialists are right. Uh, then it follows of necessity that practically all of our information regarding the millennium will concern a Jewish or Israelite age. Duh. That's exactly right. And here uh, is a diagram I took our diagram from the chart that I call it the kingdom of man in history and prophecy. The kingdom of man began after the flood at the Tower of Babel. Why? Because there you had the first corporate effort of rebellion against God where a kingdom, Babel, was set up with Nimrod, apparently the head over it, to corporately to get everybody together in a kingdom to rebel against God because God told them to be fruitful and multiply and spread across the earth. They said, no, we're going to build the first United Nations building, whether you like it or not, and we are going to uh, stay together to maybe somehow protect us against the judgment of God. And so that, that began the corporate rebellion of God at Babylon. So it begins at Babylon, and I believe it's going to end at Babylon, but that's a whole other story. That's why Babylon's going to be rebuilt. Uh, Babylon's mentioned over a city, the city, not the country, is mentioned over 500 times in the Bible. And next to Jerusalem, it's the most frequently mentioned city in the Bible. And this is why, with that backdrop, God did what? He called Abram out of Ur, the Chaldees, right out of Babylon, southern Babylon to be exact. And he took this person and he started building the counterculture or the kingdom of God with Abram. You've got to see that in the Bible. It's set against as a reaction to man's efforts to build the kingdom of God. And so what we've seen since the flood is man's reinterpretation of history to support his notion of the kingdom of man, of his rebellion against God, as opposed to God's viewpoint, which is the Bible. And this is why at every point, educational institutions... Uh, unbelievers are cooperative with the world system to reinterpret, to make us uh, appear to be uh, guys who have two brains, one's lost and the other's out looking for it. And so I call this the Kingdom of Man History Revision Project. And so you have all the religions of the world and all of this kind of stuff out there to reinterpret. That's what Islam is, isn't it? It's a reinterpretation of the Bible. Instead of God calling him Abraham, he calls Ishmael, you see, and they switch everything. They, they change everything. Mormonism and all of these false religions. And then false doctrine, of course, that where people who claim to be Christians is also part of this system of the kingdom of man. Now, you have the Abrahamic covenant, and this was God's movement, as I said, where he promised a land, a seed, and to be a worldwide blessing. And chapter 12, he promises this. In chapter 15, he actually cuts the covenant. He renews it, as we'll see 20 times in the book of Genesis. So you have the land covenant that is expounded upon in Deuteronomy 30. You have the Davidic covenant relating to the seed in 2 Samuel 7. And the new covenant for the nation of Israel in Jeremiah 31 that we get to partake of, as the Apostle Paul says in the New Testament. And so basically, the covenant is repeated to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The land aspects are repeated, and their descendants 20 times in the book of Genesis. You think God's trying to emphasize something, wouldn't you? He repeats this 20 times to the physical descendants, the land promises alone. Now, we see in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where he says, and your house talking to David and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. 
and your throne shall be established forever. So here we see the Davidic promise uh, made to David and mediated through Jesus the Messiah of an eternal dynasty, an eternal throne, an eternal kingdom, and an eternal descendant. And so all of this will be for, uh, are, are mediated, fulfilled through Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Messiah. And we see the Old Testament millennium is talked about all throughout, or the kingdom. See, if you believe that there's going to be a literal earthly kingdom in the Old Testament, you have to be premillennial. You have to be. You cannot be postmillennial or amillennial because it won't work. In other words, the logic of the theology. So the Old Testament taught the millennial kingdom when referring to the Davidic kingdom, but did not specify or designate its length. And here are a lot of references here. Psalm 2, Isaiah 2, Isaiah 11, Isaiah 65, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 40 through 48 gives a nine-chapter description of this time. Daniel 2, Joel 2, Micah 4, 1 through 7. Did I tell you I have a grandson named Micah? I think I told you last year. Oh, well. Uh, Zephaniah. I also have a new grandson named Josiah, the good king Josiah. Well, uh, and when you look at some of the passages in the Old Testament, you can see that it anticipates the thousand-year reign. And like Isaiah 65, 20, it says, No longer will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days, for the youth will die at 100 years. Think of the lifespan of a thousand years, and then if you die at 100, it says you're thought to be a youth. I mean, that's anticipating the thousand-year millennium that's going to be later revealed in the New Testament, you see. Uh, And so you see this in the Old Testament. And then you have, of course, in Isaiah 24 through 27, it's called the little apocalypse. So it will happen in that day that the Lord will punish the host of heaven. This sounds like you're reading Isaiah, I mean, Revelation 19 and 20 on high and the kings of the earth on the earth. And they will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon, will be confined in prison, and after many days they will be punished. That's the millennium there. It's called after many days is a reference to the period we know in the New Testament as the millennium. So here it's called in the Old Testament many days. Uh, Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. Now, Where's, where's Jerusalem located? In Israel. And here's the word Zion. By the way, used over 120 times. God calls himself a Zionist many times in the Old Testament. That's a whole other issue that our previous speaker talked about. And we see Isaiah 2 also talking about the mountain of the Lord will go up, and this is Jerusalem and all of this kind of stuff. And uh, he talks about then we'll have peace. So the kingdom will be on earth, not in heaven. Never is it said to be in heaven. And we see Isaiah eleven nine. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Then we see the kingdom will be on, whoops, same, another passage. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations of thy inheritance in the very ends of the earth as thy possession. So the son, the victorious son who has won the victory is now calling people out for a future time of reign and rule. And Israel will be reestablished in her own land, Amos 9.15. I will also plant them in their land and they will not again be rooted out from their land which I have given thee them, says the Lord your God. Now, how do, you, how do you take this if you don't believe in premillennialism? You say it's a church. Well, the language doesn't say that. I know. And that's what allegorization is. Literal interpretation means to interpret based on the letter. In other words, to interpret based on what is written in the text. That's how you interpret all literature. Doesn't matter what its genre is. You recognize the genre of the literature in the process of reading the words of the text. And allegorical interpretation, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the mother of all dictionaries out there, says the opposite of literal interpretation is allegorical interpretation, where you bring thoughts or ideas 
from outside the text and impose them on the text. So they make this to be the church. It doesn't say church, and they agree. So they're engaging in allegorical interpretation, even though they think they're justified somehow by the New Testament. Now, the kingdom shall extend to the whole earth and include believing Gentiles. Uh, Isaiah 49, 6. Is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel? See, the restorationism here. And I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. And so Israel is going to play the crucial role in this. Christ shall reign as king over all the earth, Zechariah 14, 9, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one and his name the only one. Is that true today? Are you calling this mess today the millennium? And we see in Daniel 2.35 when this is going to happen. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze. And this is uh, the picture here, the symbolism of the kingdom of man in its different phases. The, the final phase is, is the feet phase. And at the same time, it became, uh, and, the, and the gold, in other words, it destroys the entire legacy of the kingdom of man, were broken to pieces at the same time and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. That's what I was referring to earlier. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. So it's talking about here the uh, the rock cut without hands, which, of course, is a reference to supernatural direct uh, divine intervention, not through this. So when you go to the New Testament, then let's see if the kingdom in the New Testament changes any from this physical kingdom that we see in the Old Testament. And Dr. John Walvard, one of my former professors, said whenever the precise kingdom promises of the Old Testament are introduced, in other words, in the New Testament, these promises and their literal fulfillment are never denied, corrected, or altered, but are instead confirmed. So the same uh, idea of the kingdom is carried over relating to Israel. So the kingdom hope of the prophets is carried over unchanged into the New Testament. Matthew 2.2, 2, right off the bat. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And you see in Luke 1.30-33, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name, his, name him Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. I'm sorry, that's not going on now yet. And this is a literal Jewish kingdom that he's to be the ruler over. Luke 22, 29 through 30, And just as my father has granted me a kingdom, I will grant you that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Talking to the apostles, the church here. And so what Christ is saying, he's not going to eat of the fruit of the vine until he does it with us in the kingdom. He's been on a diet for 2,000 years. He's literally at the marriage supper of the Lamb in the kingdom going to sit down and we're going to have a meal together. It's real physical stuff. It's not some abstract thing for communion here. And we go to the New Testament in Acts chapter 1 where the apostles, it says had been having a lesson for 40 days on the kingdom of God. Now, I know these guys were slow, but you would have think if God had taught them, if Christ had taught them that the kingdom is now some spiritual entity in the church that's within your little wicked, depraved heart, uh, as some say, then they would have at least caught the big idea of the thing. But instead, uh, they say... Well, let's look at Luke 22. I got all wound up over there over Acts 1. And he he talks about eating again at my kingdom, and you sit on the thrones judging 12 tribes. So here in Acts, he says, so when they had come together, uh, Jesus is about to blast off from planet Earth. They're on the Mount of Olives. They're asking him, imperfect tense, meaning they're continually asking him. In other words, one guy would come up and ask him, another guy would ask him, all these different, you know, they all had the same uh, thing on their mind. 
Lord, is it that this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, he didn't say, oh, you're wrong. You know, it's been the perfect place to correct them. He said, it is not for you to know the times of the epics. In other words, he doesn't correct their view of the kingdom for Israel, but instead he says it's not the time. And then he gives the great, basically the great commission. We're going to go preach the gospel to the whole world. And notice he says, the times or epics which the Father has fixed in his own authority. There's the time of the kingdom, the time of, the, of prophetic events are fixed. They're locked in. But we don't know when they're going to occur. And Acts 3 is kind of a follow-up to this. After, after Peter has preached to his fellow Jews there in the temple area, and he says this, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets... Do you realize of the 16 prophets in the Old Testament, all but Jonah talk about a restoration of the kingdom to Israel in the future? 15 out of 16 of the prophets talk about that. Uh, That his Christ, his Messiah, should suffer, he is thus fulfilled. See, he's fulfilled the qualifications. Repent, therefore, you know, the Hebrew word is shuv or shuvah. And even today, Jews talk about uh, non-practicing Jews uh, who come to practice Judaism. They call that doing shuva, turning around, doing repentance, coming back into Judaism. So he's using that word, repent, therefore. In other words, change your way of thinking and return that your sins may be wiped away. In other words, come to Christ, come to the cross, he's your Messiah, in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That's a description of the millennium. That's a broad description that describes all of these wonderful times. And apparently Jesus didn't believe that we were in it, or Peter didn't. That the times, and, and many amillennialists, postmillennialists believe the kingdom started with Christ's first coming, you see, and, he, and he's gone here. Uh, and in that he may send Jesus the Christ, in other words, the Messiah appointed for you, for you Jewish people, whom heaven must receive. What did I tell you? He's sitting at the right hand. Whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration. So here you have a noun, restoration. What was the verb used back in Acts 1? Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? And so for more information is being given here in Acts 3 where he says that period of restoration, in other words, the Jews are in disobedience, but there's going to come a time where they're going to be restored and Israel is restored. Is that period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient times. And so Peter talks about a, expecting a literal kingdom and the condition for That kingdom would come in is Jewish belief, which will happen during the tribulation. And then we see in Luke 22, 29, and he talks about eating and drinking his kingdom uh, that we've already seen parallel verses talking about judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And Luke 22, 29, uh, where uh, the mother of some of the disciples wanted to know who's going to sit at your right hand in your kingdom. In other words, who's going to be in your cabinet, so to speak, during your administration? And she saw it as a physical kingdom, and so did Jesus. And we see in Mark 14, 25, Truly I say to you, I shall never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. The point is, every time the New Testament talks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, uh, and it talks about the timing of it, it's always seen as future. It's never in the New Testament, said to be there. There are passages that says it's at hand. It's near. Why was it near? Why was it at hand? Because Jesus was there. It was available. But at hand doesn't mean arrived. If you don't believe me, then just ask the Buffalo Bills. Football. Four times they've been in the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl championship has been near, but it's never arrived in Buffalo yet. Um, see, Minnesota Vikings as well. Four times they've been in the Super Bowl. So just because something is near doesn't mean it's arrived. If I knew more about hockey, I'd give you a Stanley Cup illustration, but I'm sorry I can't. Uh, then he 
uh, so all references to the timing of the kingdom in the New Testament are future. And I wanted to talk about the mysteries of the kingdom because this is where in Matthew 13 where you have the announcement of the postponement of the kingdom and what's going to happen during the inter-advent age. Remember I explained to you the inter-advent age between the two comings of Christ. And one of my former professors, Stanley Toussaint, said, it is extremely important that one notes that the new revelation concerns the kingdom of the heavens in Matthew 13. The same kingdom is in view in Matthew 13 as the one that was proclaimed as being at hand in Matthew 3, uh, Matthew 4, and Matthew 10. In chapter 13, the king is giving additional information concerning the kingdom of heaven, information that has never before been revealed. So he is instructing his disciples regarding a hitherto unrevealed period of time to the establishment of the kingdom. So this new age, the kingdom he's talking about, not the new age movement, uh, would not be the promised kingdom, nor would it be, strictly speaking, a kingdom in the so-called mystery form. And this is where a lot of people have taken the phrase mysteries of the kingdom and turned that into a inner advent kingdom, as I was talking about earlier. So, but it doesn't say that. It simply says mysteries of the kingdom is what the text says. Thus, the mysteries of the kingdom of the heavens relate to the span in which the millennial kingdom is being postponed. By the way, the kingdom of heaven originates in Daniel's prophecy thing. Here's a guy, George N. H. Peters, a Lutheran, who wrote in the late 1800s, uh, who wrote the most extensive defense of premillennialism called uh, the, no, what's it called? Uh, the Theocratic Kingdom. It's like 4,000 pages in three volumes with thousands of footnotes. And only a German could have produced that. <clears throat> he had just immigrated from Germany. Uh, and he was kicked out of his Lutheran denomination for writing it. But that's a whole other story. And he says, the very outskirts of the subject already forced the conclusion that those mysteries refer not to the nature of the kingdom, but to the manner of its establishment, the means employed, the preparation for it, the time for its manifestation and related subjects. In other words, there in Matthew 13. And so we see the time of the establishing of the kingdom, we see the preparation for the kingdom, and thirdly, being presented in Matthew 13, the new material which had never before been revealed. This is why he says, I bring out of my storehouse things old. In other words, the view of the kingdom is not changed, and things new. What are the new things? Well, in light of Jewish rejection in chapter 12, the postponement of the kingdom, basically, is what he's saying. So first, this view is consistent that it's totally future. It's consistent with the uniform New Testament concept of the kingdom. Secondly, this view is in agreement with the Old Testament prophecies of the kingdom. So we see this, number one, the Old Testament expected a judgment to precede the establishment of the kingdom. And that's what you see in the parables. He's going to sit down at the end of the age like a fisherman and pick out separate the believers from the unbelievers, certain fish from other fish. So the Old Testament expected a judgment to precede the establishment of the kingdom. Secondly, the Old Testament prophet foresaw the giving of rewards to the righteous which would be manifest in the kingdom. The parables state the same truth about rewarding to believers. Thirdly, Daniel's prophecy of the stone cut without hands indicates that the coming of the kingdom would be supernatural. The parables state the same fact. And then fourthly, the kingdom was to come suddenly. Again, the parable agrees. Fifthly, the authority of the prophesied messianic kingdom was to be universal. The kingdom presented in Matthew 13 likewise extends throughout the world, as we already saw in the Old Testament. So the conclusion is the nature of the kingdom portrayed in the parables is the same as that pictured in the Old Testament prophets. See, because the reason why we're harping on this is because these people say the kingdom changed from a physical kingdom and they'll often berate you if you believe in that, that you believe in a fleshly, physical kingdom. And we believe in a spiritual kingdom. Like we're just these great spiritual things. Yeah, you believe in a spiritual kingdom because you're influenced by Greek philosophy who thought anything physical was bad. Biblical salvation includes the total person. A person's Non-physical being is saved, but his physical aspect, that's why you have a new creation in everything. In fact, one of Christ's 
the only two references to the word regeneration in the New Testament, and one of them is in Matthew, in the regeneration, that's what he calls the millennium. See, because we're going to be physically resurrected new people to live in a physically resurrected world called the new creation, you see. And so uh, that's just Greek philosophy if they think uh, God doesn't care about the physical as well. He does, but it's happening in two spa- stages, a spiritual first and then the physical in the future. So as Toussaint concludes, because the Jewish rejection of the Messiah, the promised kingdom is now held in abeyance, the parables of Matthew 13 reveal new truths involving the preparation for the establishment of the kingdom during this time of postponement, which was not predicted in Daniel's 70 weeks or other Old Testament prophecies. So that's basically what this, uh, the, the mysteries of the kingdom are about, the postponement of the kingdom. So premillennialism is further validated because of the great consummating promise of Revelation 20. Six times it says it's going to be a thousand years. I had a debate a few years ago with a guy named G.K. Bill, who is one of the leading amillennial commentators. Just so happened he was a classmate of mine at Dallas Seminary who went bad. He went over to the dark side. But in this uh, debate... I ask him, and this is the problem with amillennialism and the spiritual kingdom view, show me a passage like Revelation 19 and 20 that we premillennialists have where Christ returns in Revelation 19 and he sets up the kingdom in chapter 20. Duh. He, couldn't, he, he had no answer. He went off into some, I, don't, I think he quoted Psalm 2 or something, I can't remember. But... There are no passages for postmillennialism and amillennialism, and this is the strength of premillennialism the Bible teaches. Jesus, you ready for this? Kids, wake up. Jesus returns in chapter 19, and what follows chapter 19? Chapter 20, where he says that the millennium. <laughs> I mean, that's really hard. And so everybody who is not premillennial if you're in a, I, I was in a debate with a postmillennialist. They all do the same thing. They have to t- spend an hour massaging and talking about how the book of Revelation is full of figurative language and symbols and all this. We all know that. And so, therefore, you can't take it literally. You know, they do all this to say you can't take it literally. And then they try to argue some uh, cyclical thing and all of this and try to argue that, well, Revelation 19 is not necessarily chronological in relationship to Revelation 20. And so this is why, uh, this is the ultimate polemic for our view. But when you look in the early church, uh, Adolf Harnock, some liberal from Germany 100 years ago, uh, said early Christians were called Kilius, that's the Greek word for a thousand, and he says was inseparably associated, in other words, premillennialism or Kiliasm was inseparably associated with the gospel itself. And he goes on, it's talking in the post-apostolic early church, faith in the nearness of Christ's advent and the establishment of his reign of glory on the earth was undoubtedly a strong point in the primitive church. And Philip Schaff, who's called the dean of American church history, uh, he wrote in the late 1800s, uh, wrote of the period prior to the first council of Nicene. In other words, AD 25, that's called anti-Nicene era. He said the most striking point in the eschatology of the anti-Nicene age is the prominent kiliasm or premillennialism uh, that is the belief of the visible reign of Christ in glory on earth with the th- risen saints for a thousand years before the general resurrection and judgment. Eusebius, who is the first church historian who wrote in the 330s, who hated premillennialism, said that Papias was the founder of premillennialism. And he said Papias was a man of wee little intellect. So you hear the same logic today. In other words, he doesn't understand the deeper spiritual esoteric meaning of the scripture like those people over in Alexandria did. But he also says Nevertheless, Papias was discipled by the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Pon- John both. I think that's pretty good that a guy who's discipled by the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John, the only ch- anti- 
the only uh, uh, post-apostolic church father that we know that was discipled by both people is called the father of premillennialism in the post-apostolic church. You have Eusebius, I mean, uh, you have Irenaeus, who was discipled by Polycarp as one of the leading proponents of premillennialism. He even wrote a section against allegorical interpretation of prophecy. And he talks about how he learned from Polycarp, who was discipled by the apostle John, who saw the vision in the book of Revelation. So the early church, I think it's why it took two to three hundred years for them to wipe out premillennialism because it had such strong tradition as seen as being directly given to us by the apostles themselves. And therefore, the millennium is totally future, the kingdom is future, and there is no kingdom now. But what is now is the church age where we are calling people to become citizens of the kingdom and why we're waiting for his son from heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the fact that you've given us tremendous word of God and and men down through history who have stood for your word and unfortunately people who have tried to obscure your word. And we see that many people are trying to take your kingdom that you talk about that will be administered through the nation of Israel uh, and they're trying to turn it into something it's not. They're trying to equate it with the events of this world, with human good and all these other things, but your kingdom is going to be a righteous kingdom and that's why judgment has to precede the bringing in of your kingdom. And Father, I can say with all sincerity that we can say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We look forward to being with you, not because we can't handle life here in the present, but because of our love for you, whom we have not seen we love and want to be with. And so we close by saying, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen.